The Heart of Art, scoping the Brussels Valley for the best artists and bringing them to your radio. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Hector Nino. Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome back to the KMU Studios. My name is Hector Nino and you're listening to The Heart of Art. And to start off, we will begin with our art announcements. And our first art announcement is um, an exhibit that the Museum of American GI will be having. Um, that we will be having special exhibits and displays that are Remembering the Fallen. And that's the title, Remember the Fallen. Um, and these will be available to check out May 25th through Sunday, May 29th. So you have from today till Sunday to go check them out. And they have uh, different exhibits such as Vietnam Heroes, uh, as well as Gold Star Aggies from World War I to Desert Storm. So for those of you interested, you can go check out more information at the Museum of American GI. And for our second art announcement was just an announcement for, um, you know, the open call. If you have any art announcements that you would like to for me to promote, you know, if you have an event coming up that you would like people to know about, make sure to send that to the heart of art at tamu.edu and that will come directly to me. So, uh, yes, I encourage you to email the heart of art at tamu.edu if you have any art announcements that you'd like to me- make available. And for today's show, we have KMU's very own uh, Director of Content Development. His name is James Gregg, and we have a great conversation about photojournalism and what it is and how it is that he will be using these skills that he has learned here at KMU. So I hope you enjoy. Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the KMU Studios. My name is Hector Nino, and you're listening to The Heart of Art. Today, we have a special edition of The Heart of Art because we have our very own KMU's Director of Content Development, James Gregg. Uh, He has a background in photojournalism, and if you want to check out his work, uh, you can go to his website at jamesgreggphoto.com. That's James Gregg with two Gs, G-R-E-G-G, photo.com. Hi, James. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome. I'm very excited for a conversation today. Uh, I'm a big fan of cinema, so I love, you know, analyzing shots and composition of an image. Um, So I'm interested to see how you do this through photojournalism. And I kind of want people to know what photojournalism is. So can you define what it is for us first? Oh, wow. That's like one of the that's a terrific question. I don't know if I've ever been asked that. Mm -hmm. I I think the best way I would describe it is uh, truthful storytelling with a camera. Okay. Uh, photojournalism happens in magazine and newspapers. It happens online. It happens in cinema as well in some cases. Uh, but the, the, the main thing I would say is that it's, it's done through the lens of a camera, whether that's in stills or in motion, uh, and the importance of it being that the storytelling is factual. That's good to have because that's what we're going to be talking about today. (laughs) Okay, so I like to go over the background of my guests and what kind of where that love for that art started. So um, what would you call home? Where were you raised? Oh, wow. Uh, That's a great question. I was born in Colorado. Mm -hmm. I did uh, kindergarten through high school in Warland, Wyoming. Okay. It's the north central part of the state. Mm -hmm. And... Is that where you started thinking about journalism? Was that even in your head at that time? You know, my the, the memory that I have is sitting in the garage surrounded by stacks of National Geographic magazines mm-hmm. that my mother had gotten from her mom and had just sort of been collected and, I guess, stowed away uh, on the floor of the garage and just flipping through those pages I think that's where I started to get an imagination for uh, photography and and for storytelling with photography. Mm -hmm. I saw that um, in in your bio on your website that this is also where you kind of, you knew that you had an interest of people. Um, Do you know where that comes from or was that just innate? Yeah, I think that the curiosity around humans Right. Versus in photography specifically where uh, some people really are attracted to still life. 
to flora and fauna, to landscape, mm -hmm. um, lots of different things that, you know, they're wonderful photographers that don't enjoy photographing people at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the, for me, I wanted to know about what's going on with human beings and, and in social circumstances, cultural circumstances always appealed to me. Uh, I, would, I was on a study abroad trip in Ecuador uh, when I was in high school and I remember being downtown and just looking around me and being fascinated by that and, and wishing that I had a way of interacting with it, communicating with it, but it was very much the hustle bustle, the people coming and going, the interactivity of that, of, of just people being people that always fascinates me. Right. Um, yeah, it seems like this visit to the Ecuador was pretty life changing for you. I think it kind of was just like a stepping stone towards where you wanted to go. Um, would you say that is the case? Definitely. Yeah. That was a place where, uh, you know, the imagination behind seeing those magazines and actually having an opportunity to m go myself was was really wild. That's awesome that you had that experience. And then you took that to the University of Kansas, right? And what did you study there? I'm a Spanish and Latin American studies major. Okay. Um, and then through there, you studied abroad in Costa Rica, which was another opportunity that you got to uh, explore another culture. And this is where you say you started photography, right? In Costa Rica? Yeah, I think really, I, I think I started in Ecuador, but the, okay. the, the biggest difference was that, uh, you know, I ran around and took a lot of pictures in Ecuador, but I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't what I would say f being a photographer necessarily. I, I had a, a little point and shoot plastic camera mm -hmm. and uh, I always sort of wished that I, I think that my mind told me that I, if I had a better camera, somehow it would make a difference. But, um, but I kind of wished that I could be a legitimate photographer. And I remembered, uh, you know, those experiences with what I've been exposed to. And so, in preparation to go to Costa Rica, I felt like, okay, this is my chance. Uh, this time, yeah, I want to go and do it for real. I know what to do now. Yeah, well, I had no idea what to no. do, but I wanted to try, and I pretended pretty well. But I prepared, right? I I saved up some money, and I got a um, a fairly basic camera setup, but definitely like what I considered to be like a real photo uh, setup. And I looked at uh, looked at books and magazines, and sort of tried to teach myself. Um, even though I didn't really have much clue. Yeah, that's how we, we all start somewhere, right? Um, and then you started a position at a newspaper in, in northern Colorado, as well as a staff position in a startup. I wanted to ask a little bit about the startup because it says that you were a photographer and reporter for a product in Spanish. Is, was that the case? Yeah, so uh, when I got back, uh, I really didn't know what I w was going to do with myself. Uh, I had this degree but what am I supposed to do with a Spanish and Latin American studies degree if not uh, pursue a master's and then go into teaching? Right. Um, I still had this fascination with, with fascination with photography. I had sort of pretended to be a photographer during my semester in Costa Rica and uh, came back and was very excited that I had these pictures, but I didn't know what to do about any of that. Um, I ended up volunteering with an agency in Denver for about six months and the owner of that agency, his name is Rich Clarkson. And Rich was very intimidating because he's a legend that I, I, I learned. Um, he was a former director of photography at National Geographic, the Topeka Capital Journal, uh, and uh, the Denver Post. And then he also uh, was a lifelong uh, photographer for Sports Illustrated and um, wow. started submitting pictures to them when he was a student at the University of Kansas. So there was this connectivity. Uh, Pretty intimidating. And, um, He's also old school and very, um, um, you know, welcoming to me, but also tough. And from there, I went to Greeley and uh, I was a, a free intern there for a little while. Um, the way you kind of break in if you're non-traditional like I was, is you just sort of beg and plead for an opportunity. And, and Rich had coached me to try to find a small paper that would maybe let me do things for them probably off hours, nights and weekends, probably the less desirable assignments that the staff photographers wouldn't want to do or that their regular freelancers wouldn't want to do, and um, they'd probably be unpaid. So I found the Greeley Tribune had a posting for a, an internship, and I thought, okay, I'm going to apply for this, and had gotten a little bit of confidence just because Richard kind of looked at my work and told me that I should start to ask these things. So uh, I found out later that they kind of 
made fun of me a little and then threw away my portfolio. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> but, but in following up, I was so naive that I was brave enough to keep calling until I got a hold of somebody and they said, you know, know who you are. It's nice that you follow up, but listen, you're not going to give you the internship. I'm going with somebody else. And, you know, thanks for trying. Maybe you keep trying, but uh, it's not going to be here. And I says, okay, totally understand. Can I please come and visit your newsroom? I just want to come and see what it is. I've never seen one. Hmm. And uh, lucky for me, his name is Darren McGregor. He was the chief photographer at the time. Actually, he wasn't the chief photographer yet. At any rate, Darren says, uh, sh sh whatever, sure. And he, I went up there, and he didn't have any assignments that day, and he sat with me all day and talked to me about his work, what it is like to be at a newspaper. And, the, and at the end of the day, he said, you know, I don't know why you would want to do this, but we do have a program for uh, students who enrolled in university that they can come once a week and take, like, an assignment once a week. And you could do that. I don't know why you would. You're much older. You have a job. And I, and I said, please. You know, he said, we'd lend you equipment. And it just blew my mind. And uh, I quit my job and moved up there and lived in a camper uh, in a friend's field, basically. Yeah. Uh, and they had more work than I could handle. So they let me work for them every day for, you know, I didn't get paid, but I got a job waiting tables. And um, that led to the the opportunity Um for the for the startup they they started a spanish language weekly paper at that newspaper wow. this is like 2004 2005 mm -hmm. at that time there was this national interest in creating um new economic models for newspapers there was kind of a little bit of a canary in the coal mine that newspapers were going to face some challenges and so they were looking for alternative revenue streams and they thought that having spanish language products would help them access that marketplace okay so they started one and they needed somebody who could take pictures and who spoke spanish awesome and you were persistent and you were there <laughs> awesome i'm very uh happy for you that that's how that played out um i pulled this quote from your bio as well it said it was there that my background in language and culture had impact that led to journalism that previously had been underreported or unknown would you say that that is your purpose to kind of highlight those underrepresented communities in Greeley, there is about a 50%, a little bit more than 50% now. I'd have to check the demographics now. But at that time, it was definitely right on that edge of 50% uh, Hispanic, Latino. Much of that early generation, either first generation um, or, you know, there's, there's certainly multiple iterations. But there's a lot of people there that didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. And the demand of that historically had been the demand for mano de obra, right? Like labor force. It's highly agricultural there. Um, so it has a history of farming and ranching that, um, you know, when establishing these industries, there were programs that actually drew up um, labor force from south of the United States, El Salvador, Mexico, primarily there, some of the other countries as well, but primarily you're looking at, at Mexico and then some spillover from El Salvador just because of proximity. But there would be these programs that would bring people up inevitably that fueled that people would stay and create community and then um, also the draw of the labor force would continue to draw up um, undocumented labor as well so you know people create communities wherever they are and there was frankly a very defined other side of the tracks in Greeley and that's where I spent most of my time in that newspaper and it was a blessing um, you know I found myself looking the way that I do you know Scotch Irish and growing up in um, you know, the middle of America in small town um, with without much exposure to different cultures. And, um, you know, I would every time I would walk into a room, I would, um, you know, need to justify my presence. And I got used to being uncomfortable with, you know, just walking in and telling people, hi, this is who I am. This is what I'm here to do. And is that okay with you? And just sort of putting myself aside and letting other people give me a chance. And I was really... Um, initially surprised, but then came to expect that people were very welcoming. Um, they let me into their homes. They let me use their names in publication, even though they might not have the right paperwork to be around. Mm -hmm. It was a time where, um, you know, there were certain local politicians pushing to get an ICE office established in Greeley, an Immigration and Customs Enforcement Office there. There was tension in the community. There was longstanding political division, um, but there was also concerts that people would put on. There were baseball games and soccer games, and there were birthday parties, and there were community health uh, 
you know, issues that were being addressed by groups of people that had coordinated to be able to bring out awareness about, you know, things like um, heart health and diabetes prevention and um, nutrition and things like that that communities serve also. So I got a chance to, you know, as the entertainment and sports reporter, in addition to doing the photography for all of the paper, um, I got a chance to see the slices of life of pretty much, you know, a lot of different aspects of that world. And it wasn't simply the, uh, the politically charged sides of, you know, being in a Spanish-speaking community. It was regular life. Mm -hmm. Right. It was definitely a, a rising need um, where you were at. Um, and then I would say that you've also dipped into, um, like, video production it, through this photo through photojournalism, um, and I was wanting to ask about this combination of the visual media with the auditory media, and do you think that like that helps it, the impact of the message and it coming across to the people? I do. I, I, I think certainly as a craftsperson, uh, being capable of wielding these different tools that we have allows you to, to have a better voice for the, the topics that you're dealing with. In the early times, when I was in Greeley, say, uh, it was emerging at that time. We're talking 2005, 2006. I guess it was 04 to, to 06. So the topics started to emerge in professional circles that we needed to start to pay attention to audio. I was at a conference in Oregon, and that was something I always try to do is like continue my own concurrent education. I was non-traditional. I didn't go to school for this stuff. The only way that I would learn is through influence by others. And so getting to conferences and get-togethers was important to me. And I went to one, and they had a topic that was a breakout session. You know, you could go see, this is about lighting. This is about interviews. This is about whatever. And they had one that said audio. And I thought, what the hell am I supposed to do at a photo conference to go to an audio session? Right. Um, at that time, it seemed a little silly. I went into the room, and a couple of gentlemen that were from the San Jose Mercury News at that time made a presentation that absolutely blew my mind. They showed pieces that were audio slideshows, um, wonderful photography, put together in a fashion and edited in a way that worked with these audio Compo the compositions that they had created in the field from real life it was there was one that was as simple as riding the bus and i will never forget this experience of seeing these wonderful images from this great photographer on the bus like the type of photography that i aspire to street photography the wonderful things like that would be like hanging in a gallery somewhere of like you know urban life and the sounds of people hustling and bussing and having conversation and there was a uh, you could hear the swishing around of water in a bowl. Somebody had a goldfish on the bus. And the sensory activation of, of, of how that audio interacted with the visuals was super impactful. And it was the very tip of the spear of a complete um, change in how we would come to think about photojournalism in this country. Because soon after that, the demand for internet content started to rise and rise quickly. So it started with this idea of like, you have to be more than a printed picture in the paper. You have to figure out what are you gonna do on the web. And so this idea of audio slideshow um, was, came, came up. And so all of a sudden we have these audio recorders that we're taking with us and trying to gather sound in the space that we're photographing and then figure out how to put this together. And it absolutely opened things up into yeah, new possibilities. Definitely. Um, I saw a lot of images on in your website and you know your composition of shots is just masterful I think I mean it evokes so much emotion um how do you piece together an image Oh wow I bet this tough tough question to answer No it's wonderful um you know if you think about something like composition there are some um some principles that you would follow if you say went to an, into, into art education say now a lot of this i had to learn later on and, and not that i ever did learn it i you know i never attended art school um or any class work on painting um though i think it would benefit me um i learned later about how the discipline of composition through you know a, a rectangle that you know that's painting that's film that's photography um 
there are some things about making images that are layered and complex. So I could tell you uh, one thing that we talk about compositionally, if somebody's interested in photography and they hear this, one of the basic fundamentals is to say, you compose your images from infinity forward and from the edges in. And what that means is that if you look like a, if you look at a rectangle, a lot of photography, a lot of your own photography maybe, looks like the, if you have a piece of content that you think is the most important in there and you cover that up either with a little piece of paper, with your thumb or something, you might find that the rest of the image is not very interesting. That you have what we would maybe call like a one-point picture or a two-point picture that you got the person's face in the frame. But what else is happening in there? There might not be very much. If you look at like W. Gene Smith and, um, you know, Cardi Brisson, some of the like, you know, more well-known, um, you know, artists that were also credited as being, you know, photojournalists or influences on photo traditional photography, you see that if there's no place in that frame that you can cover because it's all content. So in a basic way, you're trying to create images that maximize the space that they that they use so that all of it's important and all of it's interesting to look at. Bryson would say that, you know, when, when we hear this idea of like the defining moment, it's not about the thing that happens in the frame. It's about there being like five or seven things, all elements of that picture that if, that they all sort of reach a moment when they're kind of working together in harmony and it makes one complete frame that holds up from the edges in and from infinity forward, meaning like the background is just as important as the foreground and that the edges of your picture are just as important as the person smiling in the middle of the frame. Mm -hmm. All of these things working together in harmony in that, in that just that one little moment. And that if any one of them is not working, the entire picture falls apart. It's like a, it's like a, st a stack of cards. It's a beautiful work of art that's five stories tall. But if you pull one card from the bottom, the entire thing falls apart. Right, yeah. Wow, thank you for that little master class. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, now, how do you plan on using the skills that you have acquired thus far here at KMU? Such a good question. I'm in the middle of it. I, I love this opportunity to be at KMU. I have, um, you know, I was, I was an individual contributor for a long time. Um, I, I shaped my perspective when I was in Arizona for four years there, just running around adventuring with the camera and mostly based in stills. Um, and I think that in a lot of ways, I, I sort of searched for and found like who I was as a photographer there. Later in my time is when I started to work with motion and um, in video, particularly in, in a web video way, which, you know, at that time certainly meant like two and a half minutes um, for the internet to go with a news story online or something like that. At that time, we're talking 2009, 2008, I started to kind of get some recognition for what I was doing. Normally in a career, uh, in I guess decades previous, if you would have done those things, you'd get opportunities to uh, get, you know, hired on in a bigger, better place and do photography. Or maybe you would go freelance and you'd have a lot of client work come to you in doing photography. At that time, we were facing the housing crisis 2008. We were also facing an American newspaper in crisis during that time that meant that the business model changed so much that everything was cutting staff, not adding it. So I was looking at, you know, L.A. Times, Rocky Mountain News, which actually didn't survive that era. It closed in 2009. The places that I had dreamed of getting to work at were not hiring anybody, and they definitely weren't hiring me. So the opportunities were going to be in, in video at that time. There were a few places, very select few that were going to hire in video, but they were not hiring in still photography. I always wanted to be a still photographer, mm -hmm. but I needed to learn video in motion if I wanted to be able to have a job. Right. In 2010, I was hired by a bigger, better place. I was hired to the San Diego Union Tribune, Southern California, bigger, pla bigger paper. I had you know, none of, of, of people that I admired that had worked for that newspaper as photographers. And I had a chance to go work there as a videographer. <laughs> and that was a real moment of decision, right? What do you do? Do you, do you evolve or do you stay in this place trying to, trying to be the same thing? And maybe that works, maybe it doesn't. You know, there's something to be said for sticking to your guns. There's some people who did that and it kind of worked out for them. For me, I decided to, to, to go with, um, with the flow of, of, of that 
you know, if I could still make it about people, if I could still make it about that, that human need of, of, of interconnecting, and if I could learn and grow and evolve into that space, maybe I could help them have something to say in a new way. So I took that opportunity and um, did a lot of learning on the job. Um, a mentor of mine says that I like to build the airplane while it's flying. Right. <laughs> and uh, so I did that for a while. When uh, I had an opportunity in Austin to go there as a deputy director of photography to go and be a manager and to do less hands-on work. And it was the same, same idea. Could I help other people be more impactful in what they did? And so I went and I led... I, I built and led a team um, in Austin for four years, six years, excuse me. Um, and there's a lot of people that did amazing things uh, that I helped to do those things, but I didn't push those buttons. Hmm. So here came you. I have an opportunity again now after, well, let's see, I've been here a little bit more than a year and a half. And when I first got here, it was, um, you know, I was invited by um, our executive director to come and be a part of things that he had a vision for, Doug Walker. Doug asked me to come and help him to, to make new things here. And there were people here who helped me to learn kind of what television is all about in this context of KMU and what this place has been. And I had a lot of learning to do. I was definitely in a place where I was uncomfortable and I had a lot to learn and people helped me. We built a team and they've taken over sort of those previous iterations of what has been done here before and they're doing great. And then we have new folks who are working on content that has never been done at KMU. They're working on a show that is going to be storytelling. Um, you know, the way that we are doing it, kind of the same as what I've done before. It's truth telling and stories that will be segmented out and presented in a show format at some point coming up that can't talk too much about it, but it's pretty exciting right. stuff. And there's real stories in there. There's real characters who have real purpose and meaning and a lot of impact. And now recently, that team is going to go on and continue to grow that. And I'm starting out a different branch of what we're going to do. And so I get to be uncomfortable again. Right. But good thing you've been in plenty of uncomfortable situations. So you, you are masterful at that, too. <laughs> I hope so. I really, uh, I really have an opportunity to do some things that I think will make a big difference. And so it's back to me making stories um, on my own again. And um, that's that's a real chance to kind of, you know, in some ways, knock the rust off and and get my hands back on some on some direct individual contri uh, contributions. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it gets me a chance to get in front of those those, those people again and kind of find that voice. And so I'm very thankful for the opportunity. I'm very excited for what it can mean. Um, and I'm very, you know, embracing of the challenge, even though I I recognize it's. It is a challenge, and that's something that, that I, I want to be able to take on and, and do what I can with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, thank you uh, for stopping by and having this conversation with me. Uh, but I also want to thank you for your work in the Latin community, for my community. So thank you so much. And I can't wait to see what you do here at KMU. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. All right, you guys, that is the end of our show. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you to James Gregg for helping me out uh, with this one episode. Um, and make sure to tune in next week for the next episode. <laughs>